Up behind if you've written a business plan. Throw it away. In fact, I'll make an even briefer recommendation. Burn it. Each and every single person in this room has a Facebook account, yet the creator of Facebook doesn't know any of you exist. Because the power of what the Americans do is they teach their children to think and build for the global community. We teach them to think and build for the people around the corner. So if you think about it, and I said this to the Minister of Small Business, entrepreneurs are not, we're not, we don't ask for a lot. We need six things, six things, just six, just six things. Give me these six things, I'm happy. First thing you must give me is an infrastructure that works. Roads without potholes, government departments that work. So when I need a tax clearance, I can get it quickly. When I want to register my business, it happens quickly. Second thing you must give me is access to markets. I need that. Third, strong administration ability. Fourth, the right people. And here is the real challenge we face with helping entrepreneurs build businesses today. It's the people. Smart people who are very well qualified and able don't start businesses. They get high paying executive jobs and companies and they stay there. And most of them think about it, they come up with the idea, but they never leave. And so because of that, in truth, you don't get a ratchet up of talent coming into the entrepreneurship ecosystem. And finally, they need capital. The money doesn't have to be cheap, but it does have to be patient, which is why we can't be asking our banks to do it. So I want to close very quickly with this. If you think about it, there are three different ways people build businesses. So what do we need? We need four things. The first thing we need is people that build with a philosophy. I come from a township called Whatville. In my township called Whatville, right across us was, a small, was another township called Actonville. And the only thing separating Whatville from Actonville was a railway that used to run across. It's actually an interesting story. Whatville was a massive township. And the apartheid government understood that the bigger the township got, the less their ability to control the people who lived in it. So what they did was they split the township in half, took families and moved them to another township now called Daviton in the East Rand. And on the part from which they moved them, they moved in a new community of people, Asians, Indians specifically, and it was called Actonville. In the township that I come from, the same shops that I went to I used to buy fish and chips for my mom if she'd sent me there, or cigarettes for my uncle, those same shops are still there. Because whilst in my township, we were building small little spaza shops to sell lustro, the Indian people across the railway were thinking differently. And they were thinking about how do we create legacy businesses? So Nana's who started with a small dry cleaner, then moved out into a sports business, then moved into a food business, own all three of those businesses because their thinking is at a different level. Now I'm arguing that we need neither the sustain or legacy thinking. What we need in South Africa today is we need a philosophy of thinking. We need people that are going to build businesses on the premise of a philosophy. What do I mean by philosophy? Something that is just not relevant to the time. So when Steve Jobs started Apple, what did he say? He said, I want to build a business that will enable humanity and computers to have an intuitive relationship. That's why an Apple is easier and more friendly to use than an Android device. It's not by mistake. It is. It is. So what do we need to do? We need to start building businesses with philosophies. Not just another me too business or just another sustained business, but a true business with a philosophy. And a business with a philosophy is a business that has an idea so strong that the idea transcends time, transcends culture, transcends people. The idea holds. Do you know what the philosophy for Google is? Do no harm. Whatever they do, however much value they add in community, whatever information they amass, all they're saying is we exist for the simple purpose of doing no harm. Virgin says, make money, have fun. Tell me that that's not an idea that transcends time and culture. And so the whole idea is we need to start thinking about building philosophy businesses. That's how we get the country out of the mess. Second thing is we need a strong system of mentorship. This is a real problem because those of us that make it never go back to help those that haven't. Us as a people must be the only people that measure our success, not by how many other successes we create, but by how many failures we see around us. We make money, we move out, we buy fancy cars. Then every Saturday we go back to the places from which we come. We find our friends who couldn't make it out. We stand with them at the Shisanyama just so we can show the little that we've amassed. 
And until we create a mindset where we go back to build those who need to be built, we will not create a better South Africa. The third, and I feel really strongly about this, we really need to begin to reward a culture of delayed gratification. Delayed gratification. Delayed gratification doesn't mean no gratification. It just means if you can wait, wait. Because your time and opportunity will come. There was a clip I thought about showing here, but I didn't. A young man who came to Dragon's Den raised two million rand from me, as it was, and I funded him. His name was Johan. And Johan came with his dad. I gave him two million. I gave him two million on the premise of what he committed to me on the show. Now the contract for the show says that we have only one proviso as Dragons, that we can do a due diligence after the show. And when I did the due diligence, I asked him very specific questions about how he'd conducted himself and his business. And he gave me very specific answers. And the only thing I was asking him was I was trying to understand the man's lifestyle. Because two million rand's a lot of money. When I give it to you, where is it going to go? Then, after that was done, in our office, we did an audit. And when we started doing the audit and checking the information he'd given us, we actually understood that his problem is he's a brilliant business person. He's just very bad at managing his personal lifestyle. And so because he mixes his business life with his personal life, his business is now not investment worthy. This is a culture of conspicuous consumption where because you have it, you need to show you have it. You ever thought about what we do? We buy things we don't need to impress people we don't like who won't even remember that we bought those things. It is the most fascinating mental thinking. Fascinating. And finally, and this is the challenge to those of you here who are budding entrepreneurs. Put up your hand if you've written a business plan. Throw it away. In fact, I'll make an even briefer recommendation. Burn it. And I want you to watch every single part of it burning. You know why? Because a business plan is a lie. You know the history of business plans? They were created in the 1930s by the Americans. You know why they created them? Because in 1929, this small little thing called the crash happened in Wall Street. And when the crash happened, the Americans went, wait, they went, wait, why did the crash happen? It crashed because we lent money to big businesses without assessing those businesses' plans. Yeah, we need a way to assess their plans. And so they came up with, can you believe it, the very same system we use today of writing business plans. SWOT analysis, strength, weaknesses. They know the strength and, the, and then the opportunities and the threats. Then you put it on a slide. Woo, investor, I've got strength. And then I've got weaknesses. And then, so the Americans created that system, but they created it for big businesses. As an entrepreneur, let me tell you, I write a business plan in Jan. In March, it's, not, it's useless because the market has changed. New competitors have come. New people are doing new things. The product I wanted to launch is no longer relevant. My only speed, my only speed as an entrepreneur is the speed of light. And so the only resource you have as an entrepreneur to compete with big businesses is you can move faster than they can. That's it. Because you can't outbox them, you don't have more money, and you don't employ people who are just as smart as the people they employ. But what you can do is you can move much, much faster. You can get to the customer quicker, you can service them faster, and you can stay much closer to that customer. Stick to that. And so what I'm saying here is we need to think about starting businesses. Just start. Throw away the business plan. Start. Start badly. Make a mistake. Fail. Make a big chamorce. Come back. Do it again. But just start. Now that I've told you what I've told you, let me tell you why after over a decade of speaking in now 49 countries around the world, you are likely to walk out of this room and do absolutely nothing about what I've told you. See, it hit me about six years ago that I was working with people all over the world and speaking. And yet every time I would speak, my business model depended on them not acting. So they'd bring me back again. So I issued my, I told my team, my research team, I said, find out for me, why do human beings look for new knowledge only to take the new knowledge and do exactly the same old things that we're doing with it before? It sounds stupid. And here's what we found. Each and every single person in this room is held prison by two biases, two. The first is the confirmation bias. All of us live in a world where we look for information to confirm the beliefs we deeply hold. But some Harvard professors did some interesting research in the 1980s. They took two groups of MBA students 
In fact, they took a single group of an MBA class, it was 40 of them, and split it into two, 20 each. They then took pieces of research and gave them to these groups. The pieces of research proved a single thing. So could you imagine where I took some papers and research and gave it to this side of the room that proved that the sky is blue? Then I came to this side of the room and gave you pieces of research that proved that the sky is pink. And at the end of the day, you believe the sky is blue, you believe the sky is pink, but we're talking about the same sky. The following day, they came back. Now, these are smart people, top 1% of the intellectual capital of the world, MBA students at a Harvard Business School. And they took the research they'd given to this group and gave it to the other, and the research they'd given to this group and gave it to the former. They took the research that proved the sky is pink and gave it to the group that believed the sky was blue, and took the research that proved the sky was blue and gave it to the alternative group. But here's what they did. In what was 80 pages of hard, heavy statistical data, they left three small traces in bullet points of evidence that proved what they believed the day before. And without fail, both groups, at the end of the day, found those three pieces of evidence and defaulted to the belief they held the day before, even in the light of overwhelming evidence to the contrary. Because as human beings, we are hardwired to look for information that confirms the deeply held beliefs we have. The country's going down, so you drive, past the, you drive past the traffic light and there's a person begging. You see, I told you, the country's going down. If you look for the evidence, you'll find it. The second thing is this, the status quo bias. Most of us like things the way they are. You know, human beings are fascinating creatures. We are the only creature that is adapt to change and yet hates making the change each time it needs to. The status quo bias simply says, you and I will look for every piece of evidence to support the status quo as we know it. But the reason we are likely to do nothing about what we've learned here is simple, because we like the status quo and we will look for evidence to confirm what it is we believe. This beautiful country of ours is at an interesting time. It is a time unlike any other, because regardless of your race, I can assure you we all want the same things. We do. It's the politics that divide us. We are divided because we forget that what this country needs from all of us is a little bit of faith. What is faith? Faith is the ability to see the invisible, believe in the impossible, and trust in the unknown.